Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage founder and CEO of the Family Online Safety Institute, Stephen Baldwin. Thank you, thank you, good morning. How is everyone? Hands up who have kids who are not in school today. Thank you, because most of the people who have kids who are off who are not here yet, they're trying to figure out how to get here. Um, we're delighted to welcome you uh, here to our 12th annual conference. Um, I was just saying a moment ago that we launched FOSI in February of 2007 in an ice storm. And our first annual conference was December of that year, and we had four inches of snow the night before. So this is good luck for us. Um, and for those of you uh, who have come from much warmer climes, this may be some good opportunities for some Christmas pictures or holiday pictures. So, Anyway, um, thank you so much. I want to just say on behalf of the FOSI members and the board of directors, um, a huge welcome to you to this, our 12th annual conference and the first time we've been in this gorgeous new venue. Um, it doesn't get any better than this in Washington. Um, please uh, explore and um, take lots of photographs and when you take those photographs, hashtag them FOSI2012 and put them out on the social networking platform of your choice. Uh, but please, uh, uh, please take plenty of photographs, there's no restrictions even though this is a government building. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, uh, we are an international nonprofit organization. Our mission is to make the world safer, make the online world safer for kids and their families. And we do that through what we call the three P's of policy, practices, and parenting. So that's uh, enlightened public policy, industry best practices, and good digital parenting. Uh, we have over two dozen of the top internet companies in membership, and we bring together uh, the top thinkers and practitioners, many of whom are here today, to collaborate and to innovate in this space. Uh, before I go any further, I must acknowledge and thank our sponsors, uh, both our corporate sponsors, but also our uh, Foundation World sponsors, whose contributions has made today and our ongoing work possible. So a round of applause for the sponsors. Thank you. <clears throat> our theme this year is creating a culture of responsibility online. And we have an outstanding lineup of speakers, of panels, exhibitors, and most importantly, you the members of the ever-growing online safety community. Uh, thank you for all the work that you do in your government departments, in your companies, in your NGOs, in your schools, in your families, to promote a positive culture uh, and to promote responsible behavior online. Um, and actually, before I say any more, I would just do want to invite up uh, Sheldon Himmelfarb Sheldon is the president and CEO of the Peace Tech Lab, which is based here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, just to add his welcome. And he has driven from Potomac, Maryland, and everybody knows that was a torturous drive here this morning. So Sheldon Himmelfarb. Thanks so much. It wasn't as torturous a drive, I don't think, as many of you, others of you have had to, to get here this morning. So welcome to this beautiful hall. Thank you for enduring the trek here. Thank you for bringing our first real day of winter. Um, I had no idea this was what Stephen meant when he said there's storm clouds brewing in the online safety space. Um, as you heard, I'm the CEO of the Peace Tech Lab here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and we were created by USIP, the United States Institute of Peace, four years ago to expand and improve the use of technology in peace building. Simply stated, that means we work around the world to put the right tools in the right hands to build safe, secure, and peaceful communities. Sound familiar? It should, because there's a lot of overlap between what we do every day in the Peace Tech Lab 
and what you are here to do today. So I think it is very fitting and very urgent that you are here today beneath the wings of the dove. So on behalf of all of us here, uh, let me thank you for your commitment to online safety and thank you for helping us think really hard about how to amplify the power of technology for social good above its power for harm and hatred. We in the Peace Tech Lab are really looking forward to this program, it's an incredible program, and looking forward to the discussions that you're going to have here today, and more importantly, to seeing the action steps that come out of this because, as some of you may have heard, we in Washington are already pretty good at talking about the problems. So we need you here to, um, as pioneers in this increasingly critical space of online safety, we need you to help us seize the moment and chart a new promising path forward. So with that, thanks again for coming. Um, thank you to Stephen and the FOSI folks for organizing this really important conference. And please know the Peace Tech Lab and USIP, we're here to help in any way we can. Thank you, have a great conference. Thank you, Sheldon, and uh, for all the work that you and the, uh, the lab do all around the world. That's really much appreciated. So let's go back to the theme of the conference. And posing the question, what is it going to take to make a cultural shift in these difficult and challenging times? Well, I believe that we're going to need to start from where we are right here and right now. And we should also start by recognizing how far we've strayed from the lofty and idealistic goals of the early web. And I'm looking out here and I can see some folks that I've known since the mid-90s uh, working in this space. Some of those goals included to give people new and powerful ways to connect, to become informed, to have a voice. And while much of the world is now connected and in many ways empowered, we also have the spread of disinformation, the rise of polarization, and the weaponization of data and the platforms themselves. And with our kids in mind, we've seen the rise of cyberbullying, screen time concerns, easy access to inappropriate, violent, and hateful content. On the other hand, kids often complain to us that their parents are too distracted by their devices to pay enough attention to them or to look up from their phones when they come for a cuddle. At FOSI, we define our work as acknowledging the risks, mitigating the harms, while reaping the rewards of our and our children's online lives. And today we will explore many of those risks and the real harms that afflict families. But we also begin with the recognition that you don't get the rewards, and there are many, without taking some risks. And for us to fully realize the benefits that tech brings, we need a cultural shift, a new culture of responsibility online. A culture, by the way, that is bottom up, which listens and respects the voice and lived experience of children and young people which helps to build resiliency, promotes rights, responsibilities, and agency among kids, not just rules and restrictions. One that empowers parents to confidently navigate the web with their kids by providing them the tools and rules they need to bring up the next generation of digital citizens. One that recognizes the special role of teachers. How many teachers here today, by the way? Thank you, thank you for coming. Um, in providing direction, guidance, and inspiration to their students as they embark on their digital lives. A culture that ensures that law enforcement has the resources and the training to deal with and apprehend the worst offenders. And one that keeps up the pressure on industry to develop, deploy, and promote easy to find and easy to use parental controls and privacy settings 
as well as effective ways to manage a healthy balance of time online. And last but not least, and we are here in Washington, one where governments provide reasonable oversight and support, including ongoing research and the active collaboration with industry and NGO sectors across the spectrum of problems and opportunities that tech increasingly creates. We're going to hear shortly the results of our latest research project called Online Safety Across the Generations. It provides essential evidence of what is going on in families right now and goes beyond the headlines and the hyperbole that this subject often attracts. We're also going to hear from FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips, who will mark the 20th anniversary of COPPA, the Child Online Privacy Protection Act. There's going to be panels and discussions on digital parenting, content moderation, new tech solutions, and one called Hooked on Tech. And we have a special interactive session on the ethics of emerging technologies. And some of you will have seen the press release. Uh, we will also be welcoming, at the end of our day, the First Lady of the United States. And we will also be hearing from four remarkable teenagers about the work they are doing to combating cyberbullying and to promote digital well-being and civility. So quite a packed day. Uh, please get around to see the exhibits. Uh, use the networking breaks to reunite with old friends and colleagues, but also to make new connections among the extraordinary attendees who have gathered here from around the world. Thank you again for committing time and energies to be with us today. Please join us in this challenging and ultimately rewarding work of creating a culture of responsibility for this generation of users and for many to come. Thank you all very much. I have to remember I'm MC as well. So I'd like to invite the next panel up. And while they are doing that, Jay and Abigail as well, um, I want to introduce to you our moderator today, uh, Un Yang. Un anchors News for Today, uh, the number one rated morning news show in Washington, for which she has won an Emmy Award. She joined News 4 as the general assignment reporter specializing in covering breaking news for News 4, presumably weather events as well. Yeah, lots of weather. A lot of weather <laughs> events. Uh, before joining News 4, Yang worked at the National Geographic Channel and WUSA here in Washington. And most importantly, she's the mother of three young kids. Three children. So it's personal for her. Please join me in welcoming Un Yang. Thank you so much. <laughs> Stephen, thank you. Thank you for that introduction and for kicking off what promises to be an exciting and informative day. And as Stephen mentioned, this is personal to me. All this information, uh, he talks about the culture shift. That's stuff. I'm like really in the middle of it right now, in the trenches. Uh, so I'm happy to be here. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2018 Conference of the Family Online Safety Institute, FOSI. Uh, again, I'm Un Yang. I'm the morning anchor uh, at NBC4, the local NBC station in Washington, D.C. My day starts when you should be fast asleep, like REM sleeping. My alarm clock goes off at 2.15. Um, <sighs> and so why I know everyone's like, gasp! Um, so while you might know me as the person who brings you breaking news overnight and developments, I'm also the mom of a uh, fourth grader, a sixth grader, and an eighth grader. So I'm an avid consumer of technology, and my kids are also becoming avid consumers of technology. I'm very pleased to be a part of this conference um, and really interested on in how to promote online safety for families and hoping to bring some of today's learning into my own home as well. Uh, today, FOSI is releasing a new public policy research study on online safety across the generations which explores how both parents and seniors think about online safety concerns for themselves and their families and what steps they're taking to protect themselves. So this new report examines how Americans of different generations, of different backgrounds, feel about technology in their lives, as well as how families connect uh, through technology and learn together. And to explain the methodology and the study and discuss some of these key findings, please welcome Jay Campbell and Abigail Davenport from Heart Research Associates. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So, 
so let's start with how you conducted the study. Sure, and thank you. Um, so uh, we're really pleased to be here and have the opportunity to do this survey again uh, for FOSI. This time we not only surveyed parents of connected kids, but we also talked to seniors who we defined as Americans age 62 and over. We started out with exploratory research, uh, focus groups to kind of hear how they're thinking and talking about using the internet and technology. And then we did surveys of each of those audiences, which included oversamples of low income uh, low-income individuals, Hispanics and African Americans, so that we could be sure to have enough interviews, robust samples of those groups to look and do a deep dive there. Um, and uh, this is unique because we are looking at sort of the intergenerational focus here in the research and trying to understand not just how parents are navigating the opportunities and challenges that uh, technology and the internet presents for their kids, but also how that's playing out through multiple generations and families and the role that parents are playing both in helping their kids but also in assisting their parents. Okay, so. thank you. All right, Jace, let's start with the seniors and what you found out sure. about the seniors who are online and who aren't online. So, um, if I can forward this, we have, and of course, we can all appreciate, there we go, the irony of technology not working. Um, uh, we interviewed uh, online, uh, uh, on the phone, 700 seniors, and we found that 80% of them are online presently. 80%. 80% um, uh, go online at least occasionally, um, but that a majority go online on a daily basis, 53%. 20% uh, say that they never go online. And the, that group of 20%, that one in five who don't go online, are entirely distinct uh, as, a, as a population. They are, on average, older um, than, than seniors who do go online. A majority are over the age of 75. They are more likely to be African American and Latino, so a higher proportion minority. They're far less educated. 62% uh, have no more than a high school degree. And almost half of them are low income compared to only 21% of seniors who do go online. So there's an enormous income uh, differential there. And that, w that probably does make a big difference on who has even access to the online for the senior Certainly. population. Certainly. And what are the top concerns you heard from seniors who are online in terms of online safety? They have a lot of the same concerns that the rest of us have, uh, <laughs> which is not a huge surprise. Yeah. Um, sort of top among them are identity theft, um, sort of is head and shoulders above everything else. Um, but things that are in that vein are also of a major concern. So um, financial theft uh, and financial hacking is something that a lot worry about. Um, viruses, just this sort of standard problem that we all have to face, malware and viruses are pretty significant concerns. The interesting thing though is even those seniors who say, you know, they feel like they do a pretty good job of protecting themselves online, are concerned about these things at the same level as those who are not. So just being vigilant doesn't seem to be quite enough as far as seniors are concerned. What does make a difference is the amount of time they've been online. The more experienced uh, seniors, those who've been online for 15 years or more, are far less worried, still concerned, but not nearly as much as those who are newer to the online world. So it seems like exposure, experience really does ultimately make a difference. But do those seniors and are they taking steps to protect themselves? They, they absolutely have the tools, are. They know what to do? They absolutely are. And they are uh, taking the steps that uh, are appropriate to be taken. In point of fact, almost every senior we talk to who's online does at least one of these six things that we can see up on screen here uh, that we asked about. Um, and almost half of them do it two or more. Um, most common are the uh, strong passwords, which we always are told we have to have uppercase, lowercase symbols, they, they do that. Um, uh, close behind are uh, holding different passwords for different accounts and using that antivirus protection software. Far less likely are things like multi-factor uh, authentication, about one in four do that. Um, and ditto for um, uh, using privacy settings on social media. So some are still doing it, but not nearly as many as probably should be. And you mentioned that their concerns are similar to the rest of the population who's mm -hmm. online. What about the benefits that they've identified from using technology and being online? Highly active um, is what I would say about online seniors. Um, we asked about a number of different apps, a number of different services that are uh, activities that can be done online. Um, large majorities do uh, the top ones that you can see here. 
Um, navigation services are sort of head and shoulders above everything else. We heard in the focus group that we did with seniors that they love Waze and they love Apple I love Maps. Waze. I, we all love Waze, <laughs> we all love Apple Maps. Um, and that was something that was particularly um, important for them. But uh, using social media, online banking, uh, just regular shopping, these are all things that seniors are doing regularly. Things that they're not doing uh, in as great numbers, but there's still a lot of interest in are things related to health, for instance, um, wearing monitoring devices that are connected online, um, uh, communicating with health professionals online. Those are things that uh, about one out of three, and also unrelated, um, purchasing groceries online, about one in three seniors say that they would be interested in doing that, though they are not currently doing it now. All right. And what about the seniors in terms of the demographics? Abigail mentioned the survey was a wide range of demographics. What difference did you see when you were doing the research? Um, I would say that, uh, interestingly, um, African American and Latino seniors spend more time online than, than white seniors do, about an average of one to two hours more per week. Um, overall, 18 hours per week is what seniors say they spend, on, white seniors say they spend online. It goes up about an hour um, for African Americans and about another hour for Latinos. Um, but uh, beyond that, uh, the, uh, other than the fact that um, those seniors who are not online are, are more likely to be in those minority populations, once you get online, Seniors who are African American or Latino behave in pretty much the same way that, that uh, white seniors do and hold all the same concerns um, and uh, are just as active uh, um, uh, as, as white seniors are. So there's not a, a lot of differentiation there. Oh, okay, and what about seniors? Are they promoting online safety to the younger generation and, and other people who are using online? Are they kind of passing along that message? Absolutely they are. Um, we found a majority, 53%, say that they have these discussions with younger people in their families, like you need to be safe online. This is something <laughs> that's important. Um, even those who are not online, those seniors who are not online, 40% or so have those conversations. Um, uh, so it seems that whether they're online or not, they're engaged enough in the sort of debate um, and the uh, situation for online world that they can have these discussions with their family. And Abigail's going to talk a little bit more about the intergenerational nature of, of some of this, but it, it clearly is coming through. All right, well, shifting our conversation over to Abigail, who's, sure. who's focusing on the parenting part of it. Um, are, are parents saying that technology is making their jobs easier? because I find it very difficult to manage the technology in my house for myself and for my kids. Right, well I think uh, what we find is that uh, when, when we talk to parents in the focus groups, they talk about things that are easier and things that are harder, mm -hmm. but on the net all in all, they're almost twice as likely to say that technology and the internet has made their job as parents easier rather than harder. Uh, and th the one interesting thing in terms of uh, how that changes is as their kids get older, they're more likely to say it gets harder. Uh, and I think I have a 15-year-old and I have an 11-year-old and I, I have experienced that myself. So uh, I think we see some of that and, and that also relates to the age of parents. As parents are younger, they tend to have younger kids and tend to be a little bit less, uh, more likely to think it's easier. And the ways that they talk about it being easier is that it helps with homework, uh, it helps their kids find information, and it helps their kids be entertained. Um, but on the other side, they talk about the content that they're concerned about and the screen time uh, that they're concerned about. So um, they're aware of the concerns, but net, uh, you know, near, nearly twice as likely to say it makes it easier rather than harder. So are those two elements that you mentioned, content and screen time, the biggest concerns for parents? Well, um, we have, um, I'm going to... I'm going to skip ahead and then I'll okay. go back. Uh, we asked about content and we asked about screen time. And when those are sort of put head to head, parents tell us 64% to 32% that they're more concerned about the content their kids are seeing online versus the time that they're spending online. That does not mean that they aren't concerned about both. Uh, in fact, uh, the majority, 56% uh, and then 42%, 56% um, for the content and 42% for the time, parents are saying, I wish I had more control over what my kids are doing in these areas. So uh, content trumps time spent as a concern, but both of these are issues that parents are dealing with. And two thirds of parents say that they wish they had more control over at least one of these areas, and a third say, I wish I had control, more control over both. So. Uh, they're kind of juggling both things, but content is uh, more of a 
concern when they're asked specifically? Ultimately, we see technology as just a part of their day-to-day -day lives. I mean, kids have to do their homework online now. So do the benefits outweigh the har harms in terms of what parents see online and technology being online and, and technology in their lives? Well, what we find is that it really depends uh, when you look at different as when they look at different aspects of their children's lives, parents make different determinations. So on the slide here, you can see the bigger the the deeper the blue and the bigger the circle. Those are the things that parents say uh, that the impact's been more positive than negative for their child. So their child using technology has had a much more positive impact on their child's technology skills, on their ability to research and find information, their future career career skills, their performance in school, their creativity. Those are the ones that come to the top in terms of having the most the technology having the most positive impact. There are only three where there's a net negative, where parents are more likely to say the impact has been more negative than positive. Um, physical activity and fitness of their kids, that's the top. Also, their children's attention span, there's a, by 12 points, they're more likely to say it's a more negative than a positive impact. Uh, and then there are children's ability to interact with, with others in person, um, a, a net negative there by a small point. So it really depends on what parents are thinking about. They make different determinations of the impact. Right, and you also mentioned that parents wish they had a little bit more control over the content and the screen time. Do they overall feel they have a handle on managing and navigating technology in their homes and for their kids? So uh, about 55% uh, of parents told us that they had a high level of confidence in their ability to manage their children's technology use. Um, but that leaves 45% of parents who don't have that high level of confidence. So um, it does run the gamut somewhat. And as I mentioned before, kind of relating to does it make parenting harder or easier, the older their kids get, and, and thus the older parents get, the more likely, the less likely they are to be confident. So confidence goes down as their children uh, get older. Um, also, uh, um, uh, sorry, I think I skipped ahead of you. That's all right. I thought there was a slide here. That's not good. Okay, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to ask about our kids and the use of technology, they are native users. We were both, you know, we were talking about our kids know how to use technology and fix my phone faster than anyone. Um, Liz's two-year-old can get on the phone and swipe and know she's one of the Comcast people. And so it's one of those things where they're native users. It, I think it's unreasonable or unrealistic to expect that our kids aren't going to use technology or just kind of take it away completely. So what are the ways that we can use it to our benefit to bring families together and, and make it a plus for us? So um, we actually ask parents um, if they think technology, if the impact is, of technology, including the internet, social media, all that, that is included, does that have made communication among their family members better or worse? And by 57 to 13 percent, parents say it's made communication among their families, among the generations in their families better. So there's clearly a sense it's made, parents think it's made their job as parents easier. They think it's made communication among their family members better. And parents tell us uh, the majority of parents, 54%, are using technology with their kids often. Uh, another third are using it occasionally. So parents are using technology with their children. Um, it's not just something they're only monitoring and, and you know, doing their own thing separately. And also, uh, it's not shown here, but 78% of parents who have an elderly parent or relative told us that their relatives communicate with them using text, uh, email, social media, and other, other technologies. So technology really is connecting generations, and parents are relying on it uh, to get in touch with their parents and also to engage with their kids. And if I could add to yeah, that, sure. another thing that we asked about, um, both for seniors and for the parent survey is, when there is a problem with technology, when something's not working right, who do you turn to for help? Seniors, by far, their first two choices that they turn to are their adult children and adults in their family and younger people in their family. Um, so there's a connection even when there are problems and issues, families can kind of sort of come together to deal with these things. And parents uh, told us that uh, in many cases they will actually send their children to help their own yeah. parents, their help their grandparents deal with technology issues. Um, so I, I think it's easy for us to often talk about the concerns that people have about technology. That's a lot of what's going to be discussed today and, and the problems there are with technology. But there really are, for both parents, kids, and seniors, all three generations, a lot of benefits that people are seeing and by and large are much more likely to see those benefits than the downsides. 
That's and anecdotally in the focus groups we heard that uh, grandchildren are bringing their parents online or to use social media and other kinds of, of platforms that they themselves probably wouldn't be gravitating towards on their own. But because of that connection, particularly if their grandchildren live far away, it's providing another way for them to connect. And so the, the grandchildren are kind of bringing their, their grandparents along to some degree. And that puts the parents in the position of navigating not only their children's use, but assisting their parents uh, to ensure that they can maximize uh, and realize all the benefits while also preventing and minimizing the risks and concerns that they have, which for parent, for grandparents are you know, around identity theft and those other things we talked about, and their concerns for their kids, particularly around content, but also screen time. So. And Jay was talking about some of the differences he found in the demographics for seniors. What about for parents and parenting in this online age? I think the most distinct differences tended to be relating to the age of their child. As I mentioned, that the older their children get, uh, the challenges for parents become more complex. Uh, and we also asked parents, did they think they know more about technology than their children? And 70% uh, of parents overall said, yes, I know more. Um, but that share is really high when their kids are, you know, elementary and preschool age. It still stays pretty high, but once their children get to be in high school, parents do recognize that uh, that their knowledge level may not be the same as their, their child. So uh, there are those, those changes that are really uh, most obvious with the age of the child. And that will continue as your child gets older. Yeah. And then the proportions change. Yes. And I wish we had more time, but I, I, we, you, know, you can find more of the research in, in your um, handouts today. But Abigail Davenport and Jay Campbell from Heart Research Associates, thanks so much for that interesting research and for the findings. Um, Thank you. From Thank you. parenting and from seniors, and I am definitely in that position where I'm sandwiched between uh, my kids and my parents trying to, to navigate this technology world. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks right. so much. Thank you. So we are going to have another panel, so I'm going to get up while we have go through a quick transition. Um, you want to sit in this one? Okay. I'm going to move over. <laughs> And I think I, you know, what, what Abigail and Jay were saying, I have an eighth grader and I definitely send him to troubleshoot for my parents before I can try to help them. Even something as simple as adding emojis to their phone or updating their phones, um, he would be much more equipped to do it in a quick and fast manner. All right, so now to discuss what these findings mean and what to do with them, please welcome to the stage our panel of experts. Uh, Rebecca Arbogast, our Senior Vice President of Global Public Policy at Comcast NBC Universal. Deborah Berlin, the Executive Director of Project Global. Nicole Turner Lee, Fellow at Brookings Institute, and Brent Wilkes, the founder of Wilkes Strategies and former National Executive Director, League of United Latin American Citizens. Thanks so much for being here. Okay, we're just going to get right into it since we're in the running, you know, we're a little behind schedule, but we want to make sure we take full advantage of our experts here. And um, Rebecca, I'm going to start with you. So we heard the research here. Um, so what is Comcast doing in terms of online safety? This is clearly important for parents, for seniors, and how can the study and its findings really inform public policy space? Yeah, great. So first of all, I just want to give a little context um, to the study. It was funded by the, but we have a innovation tech grant, and I, I want to throw this out because I know there are probably some people here who are in academics or public policy, and I just want to make sure you're aware of it because this was funded through a competitive grant process that we have. It's largely technology, but it's also policy. So if anyone has some further research ideas to do, please holler at us, and we'll connect you with a, with a grant for, um, for uh, being able to come in and apply. So I think the, the most striking thing to me about the study, and the other thing I would do is encourage everybody um, to do a deeper dive into the data. It is a rich minefield of, of data in there. No matter what your perspective is, you'll find something interesting in there. What struck me from the data was the complexity of our relationship with technology and, and the internet, which in some ways is not at all surprising because it's embedded into our lives, it's embedded into our kids' lives, it's increasingly embedded into our own parents' lives, but everybody's starting to appreciate and become more familiar with the, with the risks of it. 
Um, and as Stephen said in, in, I think, the opening letter that, that uh, prefaces the study, we're constantly doing this cost-benefit risk analysis. And what we need to do is keep on trying to figure out together how to move the needle in the right direction. On the, on the parent side, um, Abigail and Jay did a great job of doing an overview. One of the details that struck me um, when I was looking at the data report was that although parents uh, do think that uh, having parents of connected kids think that being connected makes their job as parents easier, dads were more than twice as happy with, with that making the job easier than the moms were, which was an interesting little data point in there. Um, on, on the senior side, the other thing that was interesting was net seniors felt like being connected to the internet made their lives better. So they were, they were very aware of the risks and the risks of identity theft said that it kept them from getting online more, but, but they felt like it was enriching their lives net. So, so what is this? And that was true across, across income and race as well. Um, so in terms of mapping some of those main effects onto what we do here at Comcast, just three things I'd highlight. The first is, we do, um, we put enormous resources into making people not only feel safe, <coughs> excuse me, but actually be safe. So on the technology side of it, we have a number of, of um, you know, very technologically sophisticated measures to keep bots off of the internet, to keep malware off of the internet, um, DSNSSEC, things that the, the technologists would know. So constantly and, and relentlessly trying to make the network safe. The second goes to, and this is what, if there were a key takeaway, I would, I would ask people to keep this in mind. The second goes to, to triggering off of what we heard that parents overwhelmingly are, want to have more control over their kids' use of the internet. And that reminded me of a New York Times article that was in the paper maybe a couple weeks ago talking about, um, uh, they featured Silicon Valley, so it was, it was wealthy parents who were increasingly moving to restrict and control their kids' online use, including with nanny contract terms. So that made me think of, we need to be mindful, I think, of, a, of the potential for a new digital divide that comes up, right? So that all parents, even those that don't have contracts with their nannies, can control and monitor their kids' use. Um, and so at Comcast, we have a whole suite of pro products that are very easily accessible if you have Wi-Fi in your home. There's a dashboard that you can go to that, that even I can figure out how to use uh, that, sh that allows you to set times for your kids, so how much time they can spend, and it gives you information, live time, on what your kids are doing. It, um, and this I wish we'd had when my kids were growing up, it allows you to turn off the Wi-Fi in your home at dinner time. So you don't have to keep on fighting with your kids about putting the phone away, it's shut down. It allows you to individually set the time at bedtime that Wi-Fi turns off for each kid's device so that you can adjust it for the age of the kids. And it allows you to control, to set up and configure content and search controls that allow you again to tailor it so your younger children will obviously have more latitude than your older children, but it allows you to keep on moving, moving uh, in that direction as they age themselves. Then the third and final thing is we do a lot of work with policy makers um, to, uh, and, and other organizations to make sure we're doing what we can to educate both the communities, the families, and, and policymakers on a lot of these initiatives to increase safety. So we have a, a um, with FOSI, which has been, I mean, my hat's off to Stephen and his team. This is, this is an, an incredible organization that's been a leader in this field for so long. And, and uh, we all look to you, I think, for thought leadership on this. And we're very happy to partner with FOSI. Um, one, one area where there's an increasing recognition of, of danger is in malware through pirated materials. And so we partnered with um, the Internet Education Fund that brings us State of the Net every year. They've developed a curriculum that's featured here as an, at an exhibit that tries to teach kids about the dangers of, of pirated content. And then we're working with attorneys general as well. Stephen made a, a, a point about the importance of law enforcement for the really bad actors working with them. So, so all in all, I think it, it, the, the point of all of this is to show how multi-layered and multifaceted this is, which Stephen flagged in his early remarks about it takes all of us working together to move that needle on the cost-benefit analysis. 
Uh, Deborah, let me turn to you. The study found that 80% of seniors are online. What surprised you most about that research? And what are you doing really to connect with seniors to make sure they're doing the best that they can to protect themselves online? They talked about identity theft being one of the, the big issues. And uh, Rebecca was also saying uh, malware and other yeah. issues that they may not even know how to handle. Well, yes. Well, thank you, uh, first of all, for having me on this panel. And thank you, Stephen, for a great job with this study. Uh, fantastic. I think this shows a great uh, result. And as you say, 80% of seniors uh, on the internet, we've seen tremendous jump in that percentage over the years. Uh, it's not surprising. I think one of the reasons for that is, number one, the great benefits that the older generation is seeing to going online. I think also it's technology that has gotten us here. So, uh, devices are now easier to use and mobile. We have smartphones, we have tablets, we have uh, smaller laptops. So tremendous innovations in that space that have made it easier and intuitive for older adults to get online. One little bit of bad news in the research, uh, Stephen, is that now seniors are 62 years old. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Okay. Well, we'll we'll go by that. Um, uh, so you know, I think uh, you know a couple of things we we see here. Uh, that tech is bringing families together. That's great news, great news. I think this will only continue as new innovations develop. Uh, my organization, Project Goal, did a survey this past summer. And we, uh, we asked 65, 65 to 75 year olds to think about aging, to think about where they would be in uh, 10 to 15 years old and how technology might make a difference for them in remaining independent and safe as they age and think about their uh, continued use of technology and what would be most important to them. And interestingly enough, now your survey did not show use of uh, health uh, devices right now for older adults, but that was the number one thing that they saw that technology could do for them as they age. So something to think about uh, as, as older adults are using technology and are using the internet, that I think that that will be an increasing use. Um, and another thought, just one other thought, is that many seniors don't have a family network. So we know that it's going to take a village to continue to support our older generation online for safety and security. Uh, now to turn to identity theft, because that is a, a very important issue. Um, <clears throat> not only online, because uh, scams and frauds occur not only online, but offline as well uh, through telephone use, which has been a very serious issue for, for our older adults. Uh, there were 16 million victims in 2017 at a cost of over $16 billion. So identity theft is a very serious issue, but fortunately, there are excellent tips and tools for all of us, for our older individuals, but for all of us that our companies have, that Comcast, AT&T, other companies, our internet service providers uh, share, um, Google and others as well. And going online, uh, they're very easy tips and tools. Our nonprofit organizations, AARP, has great information as well as some of our other nonprofit organizations like the National Consumers League and Consumer Action. So the, the information is out there, the government as well, the Federal Trade Commission has a great website that has information. So uh, I think there's, there's information out there and uh, there's, there's much that we can do as we saw one of the slides show mm -hmm. that our seniors are taking advantage of that as well. Nicole, in Stephen's introductory letter, 
he said how difficult it is to be a parent at this digital age and the research from Jane Abigail, same thing. We're in this sandwich generation, I say we, because you know, you have kids, you're trying to protect the content and screen time, and you're also trying to protect your parents mm -hmm. from making sure their identity is stolen or just even helping them get online. Right. Are parents doing a good job and what can they be doing to improve in this department? Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Fossey, for having me, Stephen, this study. Um, as a researcher at Brookings, anything with evidence is always important to me. <laughs> I just want to actually put out there, first and foremost, I got to do a better job as a parent after That's looking at the same. report, okay? <laughs> I said the same thing. As a parent, I'm a 16-year-old and 12-year-old, I need to really yeah. look at the report intensely and see what I'm doing wrong. Um, because as we know, the train has left the station when it comes to technology use. For those of us who have followed this for a really long time, we've seen this upward trajectory in terms of tech use among young people and we've also seen historically this disconnect between what parents and elders are sort of doing to navigate through this realm of technology use. Traditionally, it's always been, we'll, we'll rely upon the kids to help the seniors, we'll rely upon the kids to help the parents. But what's really interesting about the study is we're actually seeing this triage of support that's actually happening among parents as well as seniors. And I think that's progress. Um, for someone who worked uh, in 2009, we published the first minority broadband adoption study mm -hmm. when I was a fellow at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. And we found that African-American parents in particular were early adopters to the internet. They didn't have the experience of being online for a very long time. So when they tried to connect, and the same thing with Hispanic parents, with their children around the use of technology, they found themselves more in the capacity of being being taught as a student versus really helping to engage their children in a very safe manner. And I think what the research is actually telling us is that we're actually seeing narrow results between racial and ethnic groups, which is progress. Mm -hmm. um, that is telling us across even income that people are very acutely aware of the, of the uh, aspects of technology that can bring danger to young people and to seniors and to parents themselves and bring positive benefit. I mean, as a parent, I look at this report and I say, okay, there are some nuanced uh, findings that apply to me. The use of technology to stay in touch with my children while they're at school. Uh, the, the day that we had this morning with one school being closed and one being open and trying to navigate through early departures. We want technology to be leveraged in that way. But as Deborah mentioned, when it comes to seniors, we also want this understanding among populations, particularly those that are vulnerable, that there are things that happen on the internet that are not always positive. And the study really reveals that parents are digging under the covers here. They're getting deep, they're unpacking what that means, and they're partnering with their children to actually nuance, how does that affect our household? And I think Rebecca's comments about parents being able to have tools that actually help them to turn off the Wi-Fi at dinner time. That's an important improvement. I think Brent would actually agree, uh, based on the fact that we've worked together in this area in terms of increasing adoption among historically disadvantaged people, that's a big improvement in terms of how technology is being leveraged to navigate through life chances and life opportunities. So I, I would say, you know, I'm very excited about the granular data that is available, excited about digging deeper into what the findings are. And I give kudos to Fossey for actually oversampling communities of color in low income populations who don't tend to be included in these types of studies. Mm -hmm. um, comparatively to whites, you know, we don't know much about the behaviors of these communities. So I would say really, um, this is actually a really good uh, a pro progress for us to see how we'll actually advance in these conversations. Perfect. And Brent, Nicole talked about the progress that's made, especially with the survey oversampling in some of these underserved communities. What about the challenges that still exist? What can you build upon what we already know that we learned from this research? Well, I think that you know, you've still got the, the challenge. Yes, there's lots of, of families now getting online, which is great. The digital divide is is disappearing. There's so many different ways of access and devices that are out there. And yet, we still have gaps, not so much in use of technology, but in the opportunities that are in the tech sector and in the job opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Nicole and I, we're still working on how do we get more Latinos and African Americans to be able to get into the tech sector. And part of the challenge is getting when they're young. And, and, and so, yes, they're using the devices, but are they viewing themselves as content creators and as uh, folks that are actually going to be part of this new tech workforce. And, you know, congratulations to Amazon moving here to Northern Virginia. Yeah. Will African Americans and Latinos get some of those 25,000 new jobs that are coming to town? That's our, that's our big challenge. And so what we, 
what we've got to do in addition to you know, protecting the families and making sure that they're using these tools is figuring out also how to have young children view themselves working for these great companies, having, being a part of this new tech sector. And in that part, we still haven't solved yet. The numbers are not where we want it to be. And so we're still pushing the, that, that idea. And I think part of this issue is a lot of times Latino f families or Latino parents were, were apprehensive about, well, you know, if I let my, my child online and, and kind of give them this unre unrestricted access, I've heard about hacking and I've heard about all these things, you know, pornography and all these things that could go wrong. And so there's, in the surveys that we've seen, there, there's been some apprehensiveness about um, what's online. So I think, you know, as policymakers, it's important for us to try to continue to perfect these tools. It's great that what we've got, right. but we've got to make sure that people are comfortable allowing their children to go online. The other thing we've seen in the Latino community, too, is, is this, this phenomena where for Sp Spanish-dominant parents and seniors, the kids become the translators right. in English. And we've seen the same phenomena with technology um, because, yes, you know, the seniors are getting in line, yes, the parents are getting in line, but they don't understand it as well as the digital natives, their kids. And, and how to how to access and use the different tools, and so they're 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 also translating kind of the tech tech language uh, to their to their parents as well. So yes, it's a sandwich generation, but it's also still this phenomena where the, those young Latinos who are kind of becoming very accustomed to American culture and society and the internet, of course, um, really helping pave the way for their families. All right, um, and one of the important um, partners in this of course, are teachers and educators. Uh, Rebecca, can you talk about um, how Comcast has partnered with schools and libraries and other community institutions to really promote internet safety and internet use in a positive way for, yep. for kids? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one, of the, one of the programs we started now seven years ago is a program called Internet Essentials. It was geared towards connecting low-income families with school-aged children to the internet that weren't already um, online. And so, as, as Brent said, a lot of the, uh, uh, there's been enormous strides in terms of getting people connected over the last several years, but those last unconnected families and people are really tough to get on. So one of the, one of the key um, partners that we have worked with are schools. And so we've worked with 55,000 schools across the country to let families know of the availability of this program that allows for um, reduced computers, uh, digital literacy training, and low, in, low uh, cost internet access. And so when people ask me, um, and we have some folks here from Internet Essentials uh, today if anybody wants to know more about that. When people ask us what determines the success or failure in a given community as to whether you're actually getting people online, the answer is overwhelmingly the, the vigor and the commitment of the schools that we're working with. And that makes all the difference in the world in terms of, um, of, of making that connection between what's available to the families and the families getting on. Um, so the, nothing more important than the schools, I would say. I want to just quickly um, tag on to something that Brent said and, and Nicole referenced about the importance of not just being consumers but also being workers and producers in this because I think that that is another stubborn um, and, and persistent gap that we're seeing. I want to do a shout out to, to my company because I am so enormously proud of them. We have more than half of our people at the vice president level and above are either women or people of color and, and the majority of our, our workers report to a diverse supervisor. That doesn't happen by accident. It happens with a lot of mindfulness and commitment to that, and I just want to give a shout out and, and, a, and a shout out to other companies to make sure that they're doing the same, the same effort. Deborah, we've talked about the technology's ability to bring families together, uh, even if it's through some difficulties navigating both sides. Are, are there things that you can do in your profession and in your expertise to really kind of move that, those benefits forward and enhance them the best that we can? Well, you know, it, I was thinking about the, the history of bringing the family together and how we have sh shifted with technologies and thinking about that and thinking about how, thinking about our living room and thinking about how we had the radio and the family around the radio listening and then we had the television set. And now, uh, I was thinking about some of our holiday commercials and, and looking about thinking about how um, a grandmother receives a device, plugs it in, turns it on, and all of a sudden, 
I won't mention the specific device, but all of a sudden, her family, a thousand miles away, is on the screen communicating with her. Mm -hmm. And this is what we have today. This is the technology of today that is bringing families together. So it's, it's sort of, we have jumped forward where a few years ago we were talking about at this very conference and at other conferences about how we were concerned about how technology was breaking the family apart. We were having our children in one room online and the parent in another room and we were very concerned about how technology was breaking the family apart. And now we see how technology actually has the capacity to bring us together and is really driving that point about bringing us together. And that's what I think we have to look forward to is innovations with technology that can actually start to bring us together. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I see that right now where we're looking at that drive. So that's what I'm, I'm looking forward to with technology. And one of the things that has brought us together is social media, of course. You know, you connect with people that you haven't seen in decades from, you know, from your childhood over Facebook. But as parents, Nicole, you and I are kind of in the same boat here. <laughs> social media can be time consuming. There is the issue of cyberbullying. Um, what are the best practices and, and how much protection can we give our kids social media? Because you want them to have a way to connect. You don't want them to be isolated from their friend groups. But something like Snapchat, I find extremely concerning. So how do you navigate those waters, especially as we're first, we feel like we're first generation digital parents? Yeah, and um, if you don't mind, I want to also say something about what sure, Jeff sure, said too. But um, I think on the social media side, I think uh, those are critical questions. And I think what the study is also telling us is we as parents don't know enough. And so we still are going to need that pathway to our children to explain a lot of what these properties mean. I mean, I, I for a long time kept calling Snapchat, Snap what? Because I didn't know what my children were talking about. <laughs> um, and I think that's part of the engagement statistics that telling us that young people are getting off of Facebook because their parents are on Facebook. But yet at the same time, many of these these communities are over indexing in their use of social media um, and it's also very very heartbreaking I just read a story um, just yesterday about young people under oh, the yeah. age of 10 yeah. who are committing suicide based on cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. that is a travesty in and of itself that we are seeing young people under the age of 15 that see that as an option. It was an African-American girl that I just read about nine on years nine years old, who because of cyberbullying, you know, was on her way to dinner with her mother and her mother found her um, dead just because of uh, what's been happening online and offline. Um, which, what do we do about it? I think that is the, the $100 million question of what do we do about it? Social media has actually crafted and engaged people in ways that we never would have imagined. What Deb talked about, everybody being in the same place. None of us, I mean, we all used to rush home and watch Star Trek and the Flintstones and the Jetsons <laughs> and all that stuff, right? We never imagined, fast forward all these years, that we'd actually see many of those innovations actually happening. But the same token, we do have to do this education. The study for me at least informs me that it's, we're having those conversations and there's some data points I think that actually look at social media use. What we need to do is go even deeper and help, under, help parents understand what does that conversation mean around use and context, right? So there's general, I can get on the site and I can do certain things, but for me as a parent in particular, I don't necessarily know what are the conversations happening. What's the context of the conversations? Um, I had the unfortunate circumstance of uh, going into the phone of my 15-year-old, now 16, and I saw stuff I didn't want to see. But it forced me as a parent to also understand the context in which these conversations were happening because as any teenager would say to a parent, mom, everybody talks like this, right? Versus, you know, this is a, a one-off or whatever the case may be. But as a parent, it forced me to say, not everybody should talk like this. And so again, I think the study by telling us that people are no longer bowling alone and trying to actually come back to these constructive um, environments is really important. But I just want to say quickly on Deb's point, but we still have a challenge of not everybody being connected. And I don't want that to be lost in this conversation. There's still 13% of Americans that do not have access. And the study actually reveals that when it comes to PC-based um, ownership, the low-income parents 
and parents of color are less likely to have those devices. They may have more mobile engaged devices, but when you can take that device on the go, it actually goes back to your point, right? You really don't know what your child is doing when they've got it in their pocket, when they're traveling to school, when it's in their backpack, when they're in that corner with the lights out and they're supposed to be in bed. You don't know what's happening versus that television was a stationary communications device that everybody went around. When low-income parents and parents of color are disadvantaged in that way, I'm writing a book on this, they become digitally invisible. And these conversations that we're having do not necessarily engage them in ways that improve quality of life and push them towards applications that improve healthcare, education, et cetera. All of this is actually what's enabling the digital economy, and we need to have the conversation around how do we advance the digital divide among families who most require access at this time to do the things that most of us are able to do easily. Our job is not done. That's right. Next. So I wanted to bring that up. Yeah. Right. Not everybody is sitting around the table with one of those devices that Deb is talking about and having a really good conversation. Right. Some people cannot do that. So Brent, how do we bridge those gaps, to bring laptops into homes, to have more workers in upper level positions? What are some of the, the ideas and solutions to, to kind of move this conversation forward to that next level that Nicole's talking about? Well, so, so there's, there's things that are being done right now. For example, Comcast and many other uh, peers have created these low-cost broadband adoption programs like Internet Essentials, great program, and they not only provide a low-cost broadband connection, but they also provide a device. So a, a low-cost, uh, I think it's like $149 for a laptop. So that's a great program to help those folks who haven't adopted. Because I, I agree with Nicole. It's not just, a, you know, yes, you got a, you got a phone and you, you can go online and, and check out something every once in a while, but that's not going to get you, you know, a job at coding for Microsoft, right? You've got to have some more sophisticated devices in, in the household. And so that's, that, that's an important thing. I, I, th I think that's a big piece of it. I think this idea of family safety is important because we have to convince the parents that this is good for their children and that, so that they are protected when they go online and that's something that we have to do. But then we also have to hold the, the companies that are doing the hiring accountable as well, right? They're, they're making a lot of money now off this new economy. The gig economy is a very strong economy and they can't just say, you know, we're kind of a meritocracy, we're, we're on top of all this, we're not gonna pay attention to the diversity of our workforce. They have to actually go out and make sure that they're building those pipelines to helping the talent from all of the different communities in the country to be able to have an opportunity to work in their company. And that means investing in childhood education, providing some of those devices so families can get online and to be able to access the career opportunities. Yes, it's gonna be 10, 15 years down the line, really, but if you don't make those investments early on, they're not gonna be in a position when they graduate from college to be able to even compete for one of these, these opportunities. So I think that's really important. And finally, I think the schools, there's, there's a lot of schools in this area that offer devices to their, to, their, to their school children and then others that don't. And it's unfortunately also one of these things where you see redlining going on where the wealthier school districts have, have these capabilities and, and the not so wealthy school districts don't. So we've gotta make sure that, that we invest more in our uh, child, ed child education but particularly in the technology space, making sure that the kids have the tech within the school, but also when they come home. Um, a, a lot of the FCC focus has been on this homework gap that's out there where they come home and they can't do their homework because no longer do they have that robust broadband connection that they had uh, when they were in school. So that's a big problem. They end up going to McDonald's or the, the, you know, some, some other place like a Starbucks to try to get that internet access. No kid should be forced to do that. And think about the disadvantage. If your kid has to do that compared to their friends who can just come home and do their homework right on, right on, you know, sitting at their desk in their in their in their bedroom? That's a big disadvantage, and it's unfair to those families that have to go through that. So we got to invest more in that. And I think I think if we do that, plus bring Fosi's message here of family safety, I think you pair those two things together, we can we can really come out with a big win, and that technology can really lift all boats instead of the uneven kind of phenomena that we've experienced so far. And not every kid has a Starbucks. <laughs> no, that's true too. That, that, right. Well, well you're right. absolutely if they right. don't even have a place to go like a Starbucks in your neighborhood that's to get the, the good in there. That's absolutely right. Um, I definitely want to leave some time for questions for the audience, for our panelists. So I, I, we have a few minutes left, so I, I wanted to open it up to anyone who might have questions for our experts today. Jack McCartney, a question I think for Debbie, but perhaps for others. Um, on the older adults side, 
Is anyone looking at the far end of the spectrum when they kind of age out of um, using the internet and, and you know and it becoming a greater risk for them? You mean on the older, older end of the spectrum? Yes, I'll, I'll, my mom is an example. Right? I suffered from dementia. Got to a point where being online was too risky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looking at those issues, studying those, and Cle perhaps yeah. developing mechanisms to. to Clearly, as, as every survey shows, the older end of the spectrum are those who are uh, less likely to be online, and that's what brings down the older. You know, there's a very wide range of internet use between the age of, I guess we're now saying 62 and older. Uh, and so the older you get, the less likely it is that you are a online user, that you are online. Um, and it is all the more important that you have a network to help and you have some sort of caregiver relationship. So that is very key. And it's certainly when it comes to safety, security, privacy issues, it is very important that there is some sort, sort of network of assistance involved in that as well. Uh, so I don't know if, if that helps. I, to, I, yeah. oh, one, one thought that that may be a point um, at which some of those controls that we as children of those parents or the caregivers can set up so that you don't need to cut them off entirely after they've been used to being on, but you can, you can um, select and curate more carefully what it is they're having access to. And if I could add too, so I wrote an article about 82 and over, when we actually see people over 80, that uh, the technology use may actually go down. But I would actually um, push out to this group, particularly in the context of safety, what we're actually going to see is more passive use by uh, older Americans over 80. And that will come through the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. So as more people are able to age in place and we see more remote health sensing um, monitors in terms of blood pressure or whether or not older Americans who want to age in place within their home are taking their medication, sir, we're actually going to see more passive use by that curve of people who are 80 plus. And that's going to be important to their own safety, the extent to which that data that is being collected around a health condition or a remote isolation is accurate. And they also understand the implications of it, accurate and transparent, and they also understand the implications. So I would say uh, if we were at this conference last year, we probably would not have been talking about AI and algorithms and next generation uh, IoT. But we're actually going to see the placement of those devices, I think, on that uh, latter end. Wouldn't you say, Deborah? Yeah. That will is, affect older where, Americans. This is where technology and innovations are going to make the huge difference in the years to come as That's well. right. Yeah. And it will have an implication for this conversation we're having today, the extent to which parent or younger children of aging adults and the, uh, the second generation children understand the implications of the safety of those devices. Right. right. It's, a lot to, it's a lot to unpack, <laughs> right? All right. Yeah. I think, oh, oh, I have hands up. Can we do one more question? Well, okay, one more, because I see your hand up, and I, one more question, then we'll do it quickly. Sorry, we're out of time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dorissa Griffin, and I'm with the Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council. Shout out to Nicole, who used to be on our team, and also Brett, who's currently our board member. And my question is in regards to um, um, underserved communities or multicultural communities specifically that are now have, I think, historically had a natural hesitation towards, um, I guess, being more engaged because of the fear of monitoring and things like that. And as you mentioned, Nicole, as things start to progress, we're going to have more AI, we're going to have more of these Internet of Things or these certain touches. So how do you help to drive that conversation between those communities um, to make sure that they, you know, don't fear it, but understand the benefits and also actually benefit as opposed to being uh, discriminated against right. and uh, negatively impacted as a result of it. Right. I'll, I'll keep it really short because yeah, I know sorry, we're, we're short getting, for time. I'm getting the, <laughs> I, Marissa, I would actually point to this, the data point in the study that surprised me the most, which was 66% of African American parents actually embracing this conversation around the use of technology. And I would say, historically, that is a new trend, which tells us 
to your point, even with um, some of these predicted dangers and um, you know things like surveillance, et cetera, that you're talking about, we're at least starting to have the conversation. And then and I, the other, one other quick thing is on the internet essentials, one of the right. things we found was everybody wants their kids to do well, and, and so a lot of times how the whole family got connected was through the school-aged child who got them online, and then the rest of the family came online as well. Perfect. All right. Brent Wilkes, Nicole Turner-Lee, Deborah Berlin, Rebecca Arbogast, thank you so much for your expertise and your insight today. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Is this, oh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Un. Thank you very much, panelists. Brilliant. Thank you. This could have gone on, and it possibly could have. We're just going to have a very uh, brief uh, transition, and we'll be back with you in a moment or two. Mm. Actually, I feel it. Let's get a little closer. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your forbearance. If everyone could take their seats again. Um, we'll get started. And if the folks upstairs in the exhibit hall can just uh, lower the uh, volume, that would be great. Shh. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Um, well, it's my great, great privilege to welcome and introduce to all of you Brian Huseman, um, who is the Vice President of Public Policy at Amazon. I'm going to add my congratulations to you for the HQ2. Thank you. Um, on a clear day from up there, you can see Crystal City. Um, so it's, it's National Landing, Stephen. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's called National Landing. I don't like the name very much. Um, that's me. That's okay. Um, but no, we're very, very excited to have you. I'm very uh, thankful also for your very generous support of the conference. You did this last year as well. Um, really, really appreciate that. And I just want to say, um, Brian and I go back a while, um, in fact, to 2007 yes. when I first met you. And at that time, you were chief of staff for the then FTC chairman, Deborah Platt Majoris. And in fact, a small little sidebar, uh, you pretty much wrote her keynote address, well, helped with the keynote address, helped. for the first FOSI annual conference that also happened in the snow. So you and I <laughs> have weather events in common. We have all sorts of things in common. I'd like to start by asking you, in that intervening time, what has changed in this space and what do you think has remained the same? Yeah. Well, I thank you, Stephen, very much for, for having me here. It's, 11 years has gone by kind of very quickly. It's hard. Uh, it does not seem that 2007 was FOSI's kind of first annual conference. And uh, I think the technology 
obviously has changed. We were talking about uh, things today that uh, did not exist or that we did not imagine 11 years ago, but I think the policy debates are still relevant. Uh, you know, I, I very much enjoyed and ha had the privilege of working you know, for Chairman Majoris. Uh, she was a great uh, public servant and leader of the, the FTC. And um, as I was preparing for this, reading her speech, uh, it's very interesting uh, the themes that she talked about, which are privacy and security. It's about uh, COPPA compliance by social media companies, issues such as uh, cyberbullying. And she also stressed the need to have technology uh, neutral and uh, flexible uh, policy decisions. Uh, and I think those, those themes, uh, I think, still resonate and are what we're talking about today here at the conference. Great, great. Um, you know, you and I were both involved with the first tech roundtable at the White House with, with the First Lady back in March. We also attended the Rose Garden uh, event when she launched her Be Best. Uh, at four o'clock yesterday afternoon, it was confirmed that yes. she was going to come here today. Um, so uh, talk to us about how Amazon has been engaged with her office, with the Be Best campaign. Yeah, well I think that was, uh, I think for me, uh, and I think you would agree, that was a very uh, special event and day. Uh, and you could see, you know, being there, how personally committed the First Lady is, uh, you know, to these issues. Um, and it, we're very supportive uh, of what she's doing. I think uh, the technology industry as a whole is, is very supportive and we were honored to be included. We talked about a couple of things uh, at the round table and that we've been working on in conjunction with the Be Best initiative. Uh, one is about our uh, technology and specifically our free time uh, service, which is our suite of parental controls for our devices. Uh, but also something interesting is we, uh, we talked about how Alexa, our Alexa voice service, how that can provide information to parents and children about these issues. So in conjunction uh, with the round table, we program some responses into Alexa where uh, children and parents can provide more information. So if you ask Alexa, you know, Alexa, I'm being bullied, or Alexa, what do I do if I'm bullied? Uh, the service will then direct you to some uh, information and some resources. So we think that's uh, a very uh, promising um, uh, kind of way of getting information out. And I'm really excited to hear the First Lady speak this afternoon. Yeah. You know, if you think of um, online safety tools and uh, so on, you think typically of the, uh, you know, the wireless guys, you think of ISPs, you think of Facebook and others, you don't automatically think of Amazon. And yet, ironically, you guys have been in the lead in some of these areas, particularly uh, the free time yeah. experience. Can you talk a little bit? Actually, you know what, I'm gonna pause. And can we have folks upstairs? Can we have folks upstairs to shh? Thank you. It worked in kindergarten and it <laughs> seems to work here. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, talk about talk, talk about how you brought that experience into free time for. Uh, for Amazon Echo. Yeah, so uh, so last year at the conference we had not launched the what we we're calling the Echo.Kids edition, which is the free time experience for Echo. And just to describe what free time is, it's our a suite of parental controls and it also includes our kid-friendly uh, premium content. And what we heard was that uh, parents wanted to have that control, they wanted to have uh, the ability to um, uh, to monitor and to, uh, to put limits on what their children can do with the Alexa voice experience. Um, you know, parents tell us that, uh, that the voice interface, uh, there's a lot of benefits uh, you know, to their kids and they want them to take advantage of it uh, in a kid-friendly way. So, um, so we, we launched the Echo Dot uh, Kids Edition. It includes a lot of uh, kid-friendly skills and also uh, kid-friendly uh, responses. So, I mean, how, did, how do you go about designing that? I mean, this, yeah. you guys are in a very unique position in the, in the kind of ecosphere. Um, how did you approach it from a product point of view, from a privacy point of view, from legal, but also from a marketing point of view? Yeah, well, I think uh, with everything at Amazon, we really do start with the customers and work backwards. And so we ask ourselves, what do parents want uh, for their children uh, and with these devices? So as we launched the Echo.Kids um, product, we took a lot of what customers uh, and parents loved about the free time service, and we translated that over to the voice interface and to the Alexa. I think primarily it's the parental dashboard. So just like you parents can see on their tablets, they can look and they can see all of their kids' interactions uh, with uh, Alexa. We also allowed parents to set time limits uh, on their kids' use. They can also set a bedtime 
hmm. um, for their kids. But I think what, what's also really interesting is we've uh, we've launched what we call uh, the magic word feature. And I don't know if you've uh, kind of tried uh, any of this, but uh, uh, in the free time uh, for Alexa, if uh, a kid says please when making uh, a request or ask, asking Alexa something, she will say, thank you for responding so nicely. Um, can we, we put that in the adult version as well? Well, yes, we, yes, we can. Yes, that's great customer feedback, Steve. Just so we'll, uh, <laughs> I'll Just provide saying. that uh, to the engineers. But we heard from parents that uh, they were worried or concerned that their children were, you know, barking orders or you know, uh, being rude, you know, to to this device, and whether that would uh, carry over. So we talked with child development experts and uh, psychologists. And they told us that uh, it's better to offer positive acknowledgement uh, uh, rather than requiring polite language. So that's why when a child says, please, in one of the Alexa requests, Alexa will respond with, thank you for responding so nicely. So we've heard some really good feedback uh, from parents uh, about that, and we can expect to see uh, that feature grow in the future. You know, I should know the answer to that, but given the discussion in the earlier panel, is that also available in Spanish? Yes, it is. How many yes. other languages? Uh, yes, so we're, we're launching new languages uh, kind of as we rolled out. Spanish uh, has launched, uh, we also have uh, German and uh, we're launching f uh, French, but uh, you know, our goal is to, to have this service uh, available around the world. Wow, uh, we have uh, at least one visitor from India any any uh, any time soon in India? That's a huge. Well, we market. hope so. Yes, absolutely. We love our Indian customers, so we hope to hope to do that soon. Good, yeah. good to hear. Okay, so um, let's move on and let's talk about privacy. Yes. A lot of people in this room, a lot of people in this town and across this country are very concerned about their privacy, and there's been a lot of talk about some kind of. Well, and let me pause yeah. on that. Talk a little bit about Amazon's approach to privacy. Well, for us, uh, customer trust is so essential uh, uh, to everything we do, and so that is that really is the guiding principle. And privacy is a big part of uh, achieving and maintaining uh, customer trust. So we've um, we've built privacy protections into our technologies from mm. the very beginning. So what, years before uh, Alexa was launched, we had privacy engineers and privacy lawyers thinking about the controls uh, and the protections and the notice that could be placed into this brand new uh, technology. That, so that really is how we think about privacy is like what will maintain customer trust and what's better for customers. Um, with uh, Alexa uh, in particular, and as we were designing the, the Alexa um, Kids uh, edition, um, we've, we've taken a lot of those uh, privacy protections that were in the original Echo and put them over uh, to the Kids edition. Um, so you have um, uh, you, the ability through the Alexa app to see every single voice recording. Um, you can go and you can delete any recordings, recording by recording, or you can delete all of your recordings uh, together. Uh, Alexa only responds to a wake word, and we have a blue light ring that shows when the device is transmitting to the cloud. We thought that was a very intuitive and customer-friendly feature to have that visual indicator about when the device is recording uh, and listening and transmitting. And we took those over to the kids' edition. In addition, we set up a, a VPC, or verifiable parental consent mechanism, when parents set up the free time device with Alexa. But, but what happens to the data? What happens to my kids' data on the Echo Dots edition for kids? And, and can you reassure us that this is not being used in any um, you know, third-party marketing? I mean, we had Cambridge Analytica. I know that's yes. not your company. Oops. I'm just saying there is a real concern about user data and particularly our children's data. What are you doing about that? Absolutely. Well, I mean, these are very, uh, these are important issues. Uh, we take that uh, very seriously. I think the, the free time um, a mode um, with the verifiable parental consent, uh, we think is the right way to maintain customer trust. And when you say, what are we doing with the data is we're maintaining that customer trust, trying to be very clear to our customers about what data we're collecting, how we're using it. And so you can see just in the Alexa app, you can see 
see every <coughs> single utterance that uh, the device has collected, and you can choose whether uh, to delete it uh, or not. That, coupled with the parental dashboard, we think provide um, a really uh, terrific suite of notice and control for our customers. But do you think that parents, ordinary parents or seniors, we were just hearing, do you think they understand it? Do you, is there a way that you guys can communicate that more clearly? Where, what, what are you thinking about that? I think we do communicate it uh, pretty clearly. We try to make uh, our services and our setup uh, very intuitive uh, to uh, our parents. We offer them a variety of ways to obtain that information. You know, we have videos, we have instruction manuals. Alexa can guide you through that. You can look at it in the app. We know that customers um, that they um, uh, they like different ways uh, of kind of really receiving that information. We don't think that simply bearing uh, like terms in a privacy notice is the way to get that information out to customers. That's one of the reasons why uh, we simply had the blue light ring that was activated when information is being collected and transmitted to the cloud. You don't have to have like a notice in your privacy policy that says, oh, at certain times this will be collected. We wanted customers to know and just be very intuitive. Um, and uh, so I think, um, I think we're, in my view, uh, uh, that we're doing um, a very good job of providing Providing uh, customers with uh, with notice and information, and I think the key is that um, as technology changes, uh, as these new new devices come out, you need to have uh, a flexible and technology neutral set of policy solutions to ena enable these uh, different ways of getting information out. So my my wife asked me the other day, and could you please ask Mr. Huseman if yes. there's Alexa for the car yet? So uh, we, there are some uh, products uh, for uh, Alexa in the car that are being developed. We hear that from our customers a lot as they want to have uh, you know, Alexa you know, when they're uh, behind the wheel. So uh, All right, so I'll let her I think, know. I think, I think many things uh, to look forward to. I, I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. OK, let's get back to this issue of privacy. Um, yes. And we're in Washington, and there's been talk for quite some time about a federal privacy yeah. legislation. Now, the midterms have just happened. Uh, we have a, shall we say, a mixed bag up on Ca Capitol Hill. What do you think? Well, first of all, let yep. me tell, let me ask you: Are you guys for the idea of a federal privacy law? Yeah. So uh, how we determine our policy positions is by what's good uh, for our customers. In privacy, um, uh, the area of privacy, we do support uh, federal legislation. Uh, and we support uh, legislation that provides meaningful control and access, uh, the right to correction and deletion of the data. Similar to the things that you know, we try to provide our customers through our technology, we would support federal legislation uh, with those principles. You know, I do think, uh, you know, as we've talked about, I think any legislation needs to be technology neutral, and I think it needs to be sector neutral. Um, in our view, the you know this old distinction that we've had and that you know, we, we talked about uh, you know um, for years now between um, the physical world and the digital world, I I, I think that's largely meaningless uh, in today's world and how um, all sectors uh, of the economy uh, are uh, collecting data, uh, they're using data, and I think uh, uh, and sector sector neutral and technology neutral uh, privacy bill um, should be the right solution for us. Okay, so that's, um, that's your, um, you know, your position regarding yeah. it. What, what do you think, crystal ball now, what are the chances of getting that, say, in the next year or two? Well, I think um, I think we and uh, other technology companies um, are going to you know to work for that uh, with the California uh, privacy law, with uh, the European General Data Protection uh, Regulation. There are some uh, privacy um, you know, laws out there that uh, either are or will come into force. Uh, I think it's I think it's better for our customers. I think it's better for innovation and uh, and technology to have uh, a federal privacy bill. So uh, we'll be working uh, towards that end. All right, good. So many of you who were here last year recall that um, Amazon funded our research into something we call connected families, and we were looking at the Internet of Things and personal assistants and talking dolls and so on. Um, and what was interesting about the research we just heard about from this year uh, is this stat, one in five, 21%, presently use a smart speaker, such as Google Home or Amazon Alexa, 
but another 27% of parents say they are seriously considering using a smart speaker to get online. So what's your, are you happy about that? Are you thinking, oh wait a minute, we're really lagging? Where, where do you think we are in the evolution to what is basically screenless and keyboardless technology? I think we're at the very uh, early stages of that, and I think um, as you've seen, you know, with our devices, with our Alexa and Echo products, uh, we're continuing to uh, improve on those. You know, to offer uh, new features, offer new uh, form factors. I think that uh, the voice interface, um, it, it's, uh, it's a terrific way um, to allow customers uh, to, to better their lives, to do things you know, while you're busy, while you're taking care of your kids, you know, while you're cooking, while you're running you know, around the house, to turn on and off the lights, uh, to tell jokes, to play music. I think there's lots of things that uh, we're just now um, kind of thinking about. Um, our Alexa service, as many of these other voice assistant services, are getting smarter and uh, able to do more uh, as, uh, as they uh, learn more. And uh, so I think it's the very kind of uh, very early stages, but I think it's very uh, exciting for this technology. For sure. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but our two, pa two of our panelists yeah. earlier uh, put in a plug for the Hispanic community and the African American community for the new headquarters yeah. here. What is your thought around diversity in, in the workforce with Amazon, and particularly with, with the yeah. new site here? Yeah, uh, well, diversity is very important to Amazon. And from the very beginning of the HQ2 search process, we asked questions about that. It was in our original request for proposals is that we wanted um, a diverse environment uh, where our, or we could uh, achieve and attract the broadest possible talent and workforce. Uh, so we've asked many questions uh, about the diversity and the welcoming nature of the surrounding uh, communities as we uh, went through this uh, search. And we think that uh, Washington uh, uh, the DC area, Northern Virginia, and New York City are going to be able to provide us uh, the best possible workforce that will allow us to continue to uh, create and uh, develop new products like uh, Alexa and Echo. Are you going to move to Crystal City? Well, I live in uh, I live in uh, DC, so uh, I'm in your office. The area, I'm in your office. office. Well, uh, we'll see. <laughs> Very hard. We're only on the uh, second day, so right. we'll see. I just want to thank you again so much for the support of this conference, the support of our work. Uh, the remarkable things that you guys keep pushing out. We will continue yeah. to watch you closely and to keep sure that our data and privacy and everything else is there, but really want to thank you also for the thoughtfulness that your company takes to this issue of online safety. Please thank me, thank, thank her, Brian for being here. And we'll thank you too. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Mike. Thank you so much. Cheers. Okay, so that's the first time I've ever thanked myself from the stage. But I think I deserve it. No, I don't know. Um, there's going to be a very, very short networking break. Uh, we have coffee and tea and I think bathrooms. Do we have bathrooms back here? Uh, we do. There's bathrooms. You don't even have to go upstairs. Um, so we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. Oh, 11 o'clock. I was told. <laughs>